Hey everybody, welcome Freedom Practice family for joining us. I have a special guest here today. This is Rick Bingham. We are out here in Dallas and I am visiting his location. <laughs> so we are here at the Anti-Aging and Longevity Center and we wanted to give you a little tour and then talk a little bit about a, a different step of recovery or a method of recovery, I would Correct. say, yes. um, a different pathway and to give you a little more information about that. So, you bet. Thanks for coming out. So right. Rick is going to give us a little quick tour and then we're going to get right into a quick little interview with him. So I'm going to follow you in. You're going to follow me in? All right. Very good. Okay. So I know when I walked in and I saw Anti-Aging and Longevity Center, I was um, thinking, am I in the right place? <laughs> yes, you are in the right place. You quit doing that dope, you live longer. It's uh, pretty simple. So I'm going to flip us here so that we can follow you. Okay, and you're going to follow me now? There we go. We'll follow you. Okay. Right. When patients first come to the program, they check in right here at the desk, and there's usually a receptionist here or one of the counselors uh, to uh, give their patient number, and that's the way we know who they are. And if they're here for medication, acupuncture, counseling, lab work, seeing the doctor, or any combination of those things. And then when it's their turn to participate, then the receptionist will let them know uh, if they can go into the offices that they need to be in. You were impressed a minute ago with yes. this room around here. This is a really interesting and I think fun feature here. Okay, this is a little room for the kiddos to play in. So if a client brings their kids with them, there's a little window to the left there that goes into the doctor's office. So if a parent wants to check on their kids, they just look through the window and they can see their kids having a good time in there. That's great. Very nice. All right, okay. We'll come around this way. The couches are extremely comfortable. The couches are extremely comfortable. <laughs> All the counseling offices are across this wall right here. In the lab that the nurses draw blood in. The doctor's office is here, and the room where the dosing goes on is in here. Patients come in here one at a time into this off in this office right here. Alicia is one of our nurses. Now she's going to be, oh, look at there. She's not embarrassed at all. Very good. <laughs> and they will come up to this counter right here. They bring that little white sheet of paper. It's got their, their patient number on it. And they give that to Alicia or whoever the nurse is at the time. And they compare that with her chart. And then they'll know what uh, medication to give them and at what dosage. Great. Okay. When they're done, then they go out this way. We do drug screens here on a routine basis, like most recovery programs do. And bathrooms right here and uh, they don't ever, they don't stink I'm telling you they smell real good okay let's go back down this way that's my particular digs right in there and if you can hear there's some really nice nature sounds happening inside <laughs> that's right I, I like that I love I like that. that yeah I think most of the clients feel relaxed we're gonna come into this office here it's, uh, right now it's not being used for anything other than every now and then a group therapy or something special like this. Great. Okay, we're going to flip you guys back around so we can pull up our chairs here and have a little chat with Rick. Um, many of you may have had the opportunity to join us at some of the recovery to practice trainings, and there's actually several still going on across the state of Texas. So keep an eye out for those on our page and inside of our group. And um, in fact, um, if you are not a part of the recovery to practice group, then we would love to have you there. Just type group in the comments if you want more information about that. And we will let you know how to get involved inside of our exclusive uh, closed community. And we would love to have you there. So um, Rick presented both at our Fort Worth and our Dallas recovery to practice practice training. It was a day training, a free training. And in fact, all and his uh, presentations and all the presentations actually are still available for you. And if you're interested in that, just type RTP, Recovery to Practice, in the comments. And we'll make sure that we show you where that event is located on Facebook so that you can watch back some of those presentations because they were very dynamic and I think very informative for everybody. But Rick has so much information about medication-assisted recovery. And in fact, if um, that is something that you're familiar with, give us an MAR, Medication-Assisted Recovery, in the comments and let us know if you're familiar with that 
type of recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just wanted to make sure that we gave Rick an opportunity to tell us a little bit more of some of the things he didn't get a chance to share in the other trainings that we did uh, both in Dallas and Fort Worth. So we are just going to jump right in. Um, I know there's a lot of frequently asked questions mm -hmm. and things that people have. And so what would you say are um, some of the big ones that tend to pop up for people? Just those frequently asked questions. Okay. Well, there's so frequently asked questions that we're not going to be able to really adequately touch on all the details of them. But one of those is, well, isn't methadone uh, just another crutch? Mm -hmm. Or buprenorphine or almost anything else that you would like a vapor cigarettes. You know, when we're talking about harm reduction or we're talking about medication assisted treatment or recovery. We're really not just talking about methadone and buprenorphine. We're talking about other medications, other ways that we are reducing harm and not necessarily focusing on totally on abstinence. But, uh, the purposes of the, uh, the RTP presentations, uh, as I understood them with, I focus on methadone and buprenorphine. Right. Hopefully we can touch on all of those the other things a little bit anyway. Yeah, okay? absolutely. So is it another crutch? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah it is another crutch. Okay, people who have broken legs use crutches. Mm -hmm. If their leg heals, they don't need a crutch. Right. There are folks in this life, what I call the forgotten few, that the chemical structure of their bodies is not going to change. Yeah. There are people who use crutches or canes, wheelchairs, all kinds of things to enhance the quality of their life. Right. We don't tell them to throw their cane away, and we don't tell them to get out of their wheelchair. What we tell them is to learn how to live life with those tools. Yes. And that's, that would be the answer to that one. Is it, is it a crutch? Well, right. yeah. Is methadone dangerous? Well, yeah. Anything that works is dangerous, no matter what it is. Yeah. You know, if, if I like a certain food, it's going to be dangerous for me right. because exactly. I'm not going to want to stop eating it. And yeah. some of us have more of a challenge with that than others. So is it dangerous? Yeah, there are risks involved, and that's why we want to monitor the methadone, and we do. We can do lab work to know how much methadone is in the patient in the very early morning when they first come to the clinic. We can actually do lab work to measure how it's metabolized through the day, all the way to the end of the day. And we can just use our own uh, eyeballs, and we can use uh, blood pressure and all kinds of things to monitor and measure if is this the right dose for this patient? Can a patient overdose on methadone? Of course, they can overdose on methadone. Can you stop that from happening? No, you can't. Can you manage it? Best as you can. All forms of treatment, even absence-based treatment, have their own nuances to risk, mm -hmm. their own risks involved, their own dangers, okay? so. It would be ridiculous for me or anybody else involved in, in what I do, okay, to say, well, no, 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 there's no risk involved here at all. That's, that's just crazy, okay? There are depressed patients who really do need to be taking a, an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. Can you overdose on those depressants, especially tricyclic antidepressants? Yep, sure can. You can mm -hmm. overdose on them. Yeah. Do we not prescribe them because it's dangerous? No, we prescribe them because the benefit outweighs the liability, at right. least for a period of time. Right, exactly. Okay, what else? Will, it, will methadone or buprenorphine hurt a person's health? No! Now, you'll hear people talk, and it's interesting where people get their information from. Yeah. They usually get it from Bubba. <laughs> okay, Bubba on the street. Right. Or they get it online from EOID or some other kinds of websites where folks don't necessarily know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. They have a hidden agenda, possibly. Or they don't tell you the whole truth of their little story that they're telling to prove their point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, will it hurt a person's health? No. Statistically speaking, folks on medication-assisted treatments' health gets better mm -hmm. over periods of time. Now, I don't really know, and I really don't believe that's a direct result. I think that's indirect. I think that's because in any recovery program, you're changing changing your lifestyle, your health is going to get better. Right. Anti-aging and longevity centers, stop doing the dope, you live longer. I mean, that applies to mm -hmm. everywhere, doesn't it? Right. No, no matter what the program is yeah. or the philosophy is, it's, it's, it's going to 
increase the quality of a person's life. Exactly. That's what we're looking for. Uh, you'll hear on the street and everything, well, you know that methadone, it gets in your bones. <laughs> no, 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 no. Have y'all heard that? Give us bones. It gets your bones and it, it clogs up your pancreas. Yeah. That's why folks get diabetes, right? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. There's no research. There's no lab work. There's no anything to tell you that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, will folks who are on medication sometimes develop type 2 diabetes? Well, yeah, but let's talk about the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Like, what's their nutrition like? Right. Well, how much sugar, processed sugar? Are we exercising? All of those kind of things. And like any other recovery program, folks involved in the methadone program are also going to be taught and encouraged to participate in those kinds of healthy activities as far as nutrition is concerned. We talk to our patients and educate them about essential oils to treat anxiety, like, like uh, lavender oil. We do acupuncture here to help them, the acu detox to help yes. with withdrawal, to help with craving. Those kinds of things we teach our clients about and expose them to that all, all other programs are doing as well. So I can't see any evidence that the methadone or the buprenorphine is going to hurt a person's health. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, does it destroy the sex drive? Well, if it does, there's way too many women getting pregnant. Okay. <laughs> because there are babies who get born to methadone uh, mothers. Okay. And that, we'll talk about that in just a second. Okay. okay. Does it affect the sex drive? You know what? It may. Mm -hmm. It may. We have some of our uh, male clients who we are also prescribing either Cialis to them or Viagra. Okay. okay? Um, so you and, can prescribe that here? Sure, we do. Okay. Yeah. One of the things we do here, and, and maybe not all methadone clinics do, but we do here is we're a little more comprehensive. Okay. So Dr. McDaniel is going, Dr. Candace McDaniel is going to help our clients with, if they've got an infection going on and need antibiotics, okay. she's going to prescribe that. Wow. Uh, if, they, if there's depression going on, that's that's something that just needs a short term for it. She may prescribe an antibiotic for them. Anxiety, like I said, we the lavender oil works to help with anxiety. Sleep disorders, uh, with people on buprenorphine, then we can get them val valerian root, okay, mm -hmm. and different other kinds of things that can be prescribed. The acupuncture helps with that too. Right. Mm -hmm. So, what we're going to want to do is address. The whole person as much as possible. And you mentioned the counseling earlier as well. And sure. How important that the counseling is, is one of those things where it's uh, we're going to work with the client to 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 do this in a manner that helps them. Ninety seven percent of our folks here are working, mm -hmm. or they're full time students. The majority are working full time jobs, and so uh, we kind of tailor things as much as possible around how that's going. Okay, in their life. And we're going to talk about the subjects that we think are really important for recovery principles, as well as what they think are important. Mostly what they think, because what I think is not really as important as what you do. Right. You know, if you were my client, I want to follow your lead as much as possible, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, what we're talking about here in the sex drive, though, we got to get back to sex. Okay. It always okay. goes back to sex, right? Is it, yeah, it, what we see is it really doesn't affect the libido as much as the uh, ability to express that libido, okay. okay, for men and for women. Mm -hmm. uh, gaining weight. It does seem that the women will gain a little bit more weight uh, than men when they get on methadone. Not too sure about the buprenorphine on the, in regard to that, but for sure the methadone. Now, is that a direct uh effect or is that an indirect effect? I think it's a toss-up. For some it may be. The ladies seem to retain a little more water than the men do. On the average, it's probably about five, maybe ten pounds weight gain. Well, how do you how do you address that? Well, the average American just does not eat right. Yeah. The average American doesn't exercise hardly at all. We sit behind desks and behind computers a lot. And so what we would do with a methadone client is that we encourage them that you, since you're on the methadone or on the buprenorphine, are going to have a little bit more of a challenge with those issues than the average American. 
So your nutritional uh, habits, your exercise habits are going to have to be more of a priority than the average person. And when that happens, people, they lose the weight. Yeah. They lose the weight and they get, they get healthier. Let, let's talk real quick about, um, about babies born to mothers who are on methadone. Yes. Okay. Will they be addicted? That's the big thing. Uh, will they be addicted? Well, this is why this is a long, long discussion. Right. Depends on your definition of addiction. Okay. If we're talking about addiction, lumping it all together with the psychological and mental and emotional with the physical, then you have to say, yes, they will be addicted. Okay. If you separate addiction into addiction, meaning the psychological and emotional stuff, okay, and the mental stuff, and then physical dependency on the other half of that as the, the consequence of the natural consequence of the medication. Then the answer is no. Babies do not become addicted to the methadone psychologically, mentally, emotionally. They are physically dependent on it because they've been getting what the mama gets. How strong is the withdrawal? Mild. Compared to? Compared to uh, cocaine, so. methamphetamine, okay. heroin, Wait. those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, sometimes babies have no withdrawal from the methadone. Mm -hmm. We recently had a mother uh, uh, deliver her baby. She's on methadone, 60 milligrams of methadone a day, which for us is considered a, a, a moderate to a low dose almost. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> she gave birth to the baby. I went to the hospital to see the baby that afternoon. The baby had no withdrawal whatsoever. Okay, now they kept the baby another few days. It's a standard thing in the hospitals for mothers that are on the medication. Do you know what? They found no methadone in that baby system. None. Do you find that gynecologists are supportive of? Someone being and using methadone, being on methadone, and using that, are they are they also in need of education about it? That would be true. Okay. <laughs> what you find is that physicians are not adequately trained, okay. and probably don't want to be adequately trained. I know that's a judgmental comment. Mm -hmm. However, after doing this for all these many years, and the physicians that I've run across, they just really don't want to know. Because they really don't want to deal with that. If they have to deal with it, they just they would just rather that lady go to a different gynecologist. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there risks involved? Well, yeah, they are, but there's already risks. So any any mother that's being prescribed methadone or buprenorphine, okay, or any medication really is going to be considered high risk right. in that in that pregnancy. But higher risk than continuing to do heroin. Yeah, I mean, what would, you know, when you weigh it out, what's going to be right. worse for them and for the child? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Great. So the withdrawal from the nurses that I know who work in the hospitals, in the neonatal units, and the NICUs and stuff like that, and the perinatal units, they tell me that mothers who are giving birth to babies, those babies on methadone, the, the withdrawal is mild compared and sometimes almost non-existent so there's not a, okay well how about the baby's going to get deformed by the methadone and one of the programs i worked at we had a wall of pictures mm -hmm. of all the babies born to our our, our ladies mm -hmm. and it was amazing how beautiful those kids are just as beautiful as everybody else's kids sure. yeah yeah and i think that's part of this conversation is mm -hmm. destigmatizing things and right. actually educating ourselves because you betcha. You know, I would just as we shared before, just walking into a clinic that um, uses methadone as one of their treatments. You know, what is your impression of that? You know, do you have a stereotype in your mm -hmm. head? Is it from something from what you've seen on TV or you know, whatnot? Right. You know, right. and um, how important it is to really get the real facts and talk to people and actually come. In fact, I know Rick has invited anyone who is interested to come and have a tour or talk sure. to them, you know, about what's going to come at, what do you say, five in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> we start early, 5.30, yeah. 5.30. Matter of fact, since a lot of folks are going to see this, yeah. okay, I make that invitation to anybody listening, watching what we're doing, give me a call, 214-328-4848, ask for Rick. 
Okay, and what we'll do is we'll encourage you to be here and spend the day with us or as much of the day as you want. I'm sure our patients would also be happy to sit down and visit with you. Um, I mean, come on, folk. If you really want to know, come be in the middle of it. If you're interested in visiting um, Rick's clinic here, just put visit in the comments there and we'll make sure that we <laughs> get you connected with him or just give him a call. He gave you his number. Um, I think that's amazing, just an amazing opportunity. And I'm glad to have been able to be here today mm -hmm. and to you know experience some of this. And I know we don't have a long time to chat about all these things. We could go on and on for sure. Um, but we want to hit a couple more um, high points here. So, <laughs> a couple more high points. A couple more right. high points Good. Uh, before we wrap up. But um, there's a lot of details about, um, I know we have here a day in the life of someone, and we have about, what about Suboxone and other forms. So mm -hmm. of all of these things that are kind of in the second half of your presentation, mm -hmm. what would you say kind of rises to the top for you? Well, okay. We can summarize the, a day in the life of a methadone patient is You'll hear folks say, well, you know, I, I was in, enslaved by the methadone. They weren't enslaved by the methadone. They were enslaved by the regulations we have to live by. Mm -hmm. We have to live by so many federal and state regulations. It makes treatment extremely onerous and makes it difficult for somebody who's actually functioning in life to be able to stay in treatment as long as we think it's appropriate for them. Okay, so that's really what that slide is all about is that it's, it's just so onerous, okay, that they have to be here every day for so for long. Now, there's a graduated system that where they don't have to come as often. It is still too stringent on the front end. There's lots of regulations that we have to jump through hoops. We have to be accredited. The feds look at us. The state looks at us. All at the DEA looks at us. Everybody's looking at us, okay? And we don't mind that because we provide good, excellent treatment. On the other hand, buprenorphine, and I'm not dissing bup at all, it's a very good medication. We use it here. Different world, no regulations. If a patient is going to uh, an office of treatment, they got OBTs, okay, and they're seeing a physician out there who's been certified to prescribe buprenorphine. Uh, it's something they can do online. It's not that difficult to do, and it doesn't take nearly as long as what they tell you it'll take. There are no regulations for those physicians. Okay? They don't have to do drug screens. They don't have to provide counseling. They don't, their clients don't have to go to meetings or anything like that. Okay? They don't have to provide it. All they have to do is suggest it. And, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying when you compare the two, both are extremely effective medications. And one of them is held back. That would be methadone. Methadone is the safest most effective way to treat opiate problems long term, long term. However, we still have this stigma. Yeah. Now, where's stigma come from? Ignorance is one place. And the other place it comes from is if your only experience was a bad experience, you know, like, um, her name's Carrie, yeah. isn't it? Right? Yeah. Carrie. You know why I have a hard time with that name, Carrie? Why is that? I think all women named Carrie are real, you know, it's a B word. Because I went out with a girl named Carrie when I was in college, and that's the way she was. She was self absorbed, focused on herself, and we never went out again, and I didn't want to. Therefore, people named Carrie are probably like that. You see where I'm going with this one? Exactly. Okay, you're not, but you know, I, right. I had yeah. fun with that, okay? Yeah. <laughs> So if you had a previous negative experience, exactly. that's going to be the lens that you're looking through right. the world with. That's why I want you to come here and get a different experience. See things as they, they can be, right? So that's those two slides. That's what, okay. that's what comes up for me in those two things. Now, the, the other thing would be, let's just mention real quick, if we can, the uh, list of other uh, Good gracious, what you call it, uh, medication-assisted treatment or medication-assisted recovery medications okay. or, ways, or ways of doing this, okay? Uh, how about vapor cigarettes? Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a lot of controversy. As a matter of fact, at the TAP meeting, the Dallas TAP meeting today, I think uh, Scott Kelly is going to do a thing on 
Like for cigarettes. Oh, yes, he is. And in fact, give us a tap in the comments if you're a part of TAP or if you're planning to come. Right. I'm going to ask him if we can live stream that too. Well, that'd be good. I mean, now, I, I, I'm going to guess that, that Scott is probably coming from an angle of he's again it. You know, he, okay. he, he thinks there's something wrong with it. Okay. There'll be other folks on the other side of that issue. Right. Okay. It's still a part of what we would call harm reduction. Mm -hmm. I think it is. And then you've got, there's a, all kinds of things to talk about with that. Nick, how about Nicorette? Mm -hmm. Or Nicoderm patches? To, to, how about Wellbutrin? It's an antidepressant that actually, for some people, helps them with their nicotine. Mm -hmm. By the way, the most addictive drug, what is it? Statistically, it's not opiates. It's nicotine. It's nicotine. And in recovery world, in a treatment world, I would say that the most addictive drug is caffeine. Mm, you ever been to a treatment program where they weren't drinking coffee? coffee? Yeah. Yeah. Give us a coffee in the comments if There's you take coffee. <laughs> There's also a medication called Chantix. Yeah. And it's used for smoking cessation. It has some of its drawbacks. There's a medication, you can't get it here in the United States of America. It's called Ibogaine. Okay. You have to go to Mexico. They pretty much put you on a three-day LSD, tri LSD trip. When you come out of that, you've had no withdrawal. The opiates are out of you, and it might give you some uh, some benzodiazepines to help take the edge off, and uh, that supposedly cures you of your heroin habit. Um, guess what? Most people who do that don't follow up with an aftercare, and I'm not sure how long they actually stay stay clean. Okay. Um, Diflucan for alcohol craving. Mm -hmm. If you have a blood-borne candida infection, okay, you are probably, even though you are not wanting to drink, you may always have the craving for the alcohol. And when you run into alcoholics who have this recurrent relapse, mm -hmm. and you can't figure out why, because they don't want to continue this. They, they may be very active in their recovery program. It could be because they have the candida infection. We can test for the candida. If we find the candida, we give them a one-week course of a medication called Diflucan. If they're right, it eliminates the candida, and craving the alcohol goes away. And is that a permanent go away? Unless they drink alcohol again. And then it kind of has to It might. Yeah. It might. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Is that interesting to you guys? Are you finding this fascinating? Give us a wow in the comments. A wow? If you are, <laughs> if you are learning something here. Okay, let's hit these last two. Glutamine. Glutamine. Glutamine is something that you get at GNC. Mm -hmm. It's based on neurotransmitters that we have in our body. And for folks who have trouble with alcohol, they can get these glutamine caps. If you start having one of those days where you have the craving happening or the, the, the thoughts happening more than you want them, you, you pop that sucker, let it dissolve under your tongue, and the craving will go away. And this is an over-the-counter kind over of thing? Over-the-counter. That's interesting. Over, over the counter, right? It, there's all kinds of yeah. other things. Yeah. Okay. A lot of different pathways yeah. and right. supports to recovery. For sure. That's what yeah. that's what we that's what we want to do. There's yeah. the, the impetus now for the uh, injectable Narcan mm -hmm. that you can yes. get training for. That you just stick it intermuscular. Okay. Yes. There's that kind of training. There's a new form of buprenorphine coming out. Oh really? It's out this week, I think. Oh really? Uh, about uh, the ones who make Suboxone film. Okay. okay, it's buprenorphine in the loxone. Okay, and it's a it's a injectable. It's called the sublocade. It goes into the stomach. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that sucker lasts for a month. Mm -hmm. Lasts for a month. Okay, okay. Uh, so it's a, a kind of the same idea as the Vivitrol, which is the buprenorphine pellet that's injected under the skin, usually in the, in the arm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that lasts X amount of time. So there's all kinds of ways that people are trying to develop treatment yeah. to help folks with drug dependency. Yeah, and I think that's the point here is that uh, to be open-minded, especially when you're meeting with people and they are looking for recovery and looking for a pathway that's going to work for them. I know we've talked a lot about that in the many pathways um, talks that have been done and so that's really helpful and so if you found this to be helpful give us a helpful in the comments <laughs> feel free to share this video or to invite other people to watch if you think that it would be helpful to them as well to learn a little bit about this feel free to reach out to Rick um, his number was given and so you can scroll back and rewind yep. this and watch that on the replay and in fact if you are catching us on the replay give us
us or in the comments. Thanks so much for stopping by. We hope that we will see many of you more joining the group and following us mm -hmm. and just learning about these things. And if you have questions about mm -hmm. um, this type of pathway, about medication-assisted recovery, feel free to drop your questions in the comments here, and someone will for sure get back to you. We'll get Rick on it and, you. and his team. So thank you guys so much for joining us today, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Bye.